It was, a, it was a couple of weeks ago, we had all our family together, and, and one of our kids was talking about an old memory from a family holiday. We were at Nakus camping and just kind of spending some time there together, and we decided to go for a hike one morning, and we were walking, and be, before we got very far, we came to a bridge that was blocked, and there was a, a professionally made sign, and I can't remember all the words on the sign, but basically it said, in essence, the bridge is broken, you can't cross it, it's going to get fixed, but it's too dangerous, and there was a barricade, and I don't know about you, but we're naturally, the buns, most of us are naturally suspicious when it comes to sign, and so we started to look at the bridge, I take in physics 12, and our kids are pretty bright, so we thought, we'll just take a look and see what's going on, and we saw that the barricade that was blocking the bridge, there was evidence that people went kind of through it and passed it, so we concluded that the sign was written by a lawyer hired by BC Parks to protect them from liability, that there was absolutely no danger, so the vast majority of our family crossed over, then was followed by an agitator minority of one that I'm not going to name. <laughs> and then he talked about another story where we encountered a sign on the side of a river. And this was not a professionally made sign. It was a faded gray piece of plywood. Very short message. And I won't read the message. And it's a long, long story. But basically he said, in essence, this is dangerous. And my son, after we kind of sort of ignored it because we'd been given... It's a long story. That warning was confirmed by a resident on the bank of the river, and his rule of thumb was, if you see a hand-painted sign, pay attention. If it's a government sign, don't worry so much. (laughs) I think most of us naturally question the things that we encounter. Maybe, maybe not on the sign, but things we hear in a conversation. Somebody makes some claim about something to be true, and you kind of go, I, I don't know. Or maybe you, you hear a story on the news. Uh, nowadays, with the, you know, the fake news all the time we hear about, we don't trust easily, and we're skeptical, and we're slow to accept. And, and I think sometimes we take that attitude to the Word of God. And, and I think it's been great going through the book of Judges this, wow, it's been, I think, 12 weeks, 14 weeks. And you see the nation of Israel, a, a people that was chosen by God to be a blessing to every nation on earth. And in Jeremiah, it's, their purpose is to proclaim like this, you are to be a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. And then you read the story of Judges, and, and, and Pastor Don has been taking us through and just see this spiraling down of the people of God. And, and you look at them and and doesn't it make you ask some of those perplexing questions? What, what is going on? Why do they struggle so much to keep their focus on God? And, and, and then, why do we? I mean, we look at this book from a bird's eye perspective, so we see the patterns more readily. We have years of history condensed for us, and God speaks clearly to this book, and yet we question its message. We look to other places all the time, don't we? For hope, for delight, for meaning, for purpose, for help. Why do we struggle so much? I was just talking to somebody a couple weeks ago and you heard them say, I know this is to be true, but here's my struggle. I think Jesus speaks a little bit to it in Matthew 7 where he says there's a, there's a narrow gate and if you go through that narrow gate, understand it is a hard way but it leads to life. And then there's this broad gate and a, and a wide way with lots of flexibility and freedom, but that leads to destruction. And he says what you're going to find is there's a bunch of people on that broad path. One life, one destruction. And there's, I think, an ease, an initial ease to following the broad, ease, broad way, it, it, to go with the flow. It, it looks like the way to life because I think we all want the same thing. People want to be happy, Right? Aristotle said, happiness then is something final and self-sufficient and the end of all action. A French philosopher said there's only one passion, the passion for happiness. And a, a person in an article arguing against religion said, everybody wants to be happy and thinks, strives, wishes, and lives toward that end. Basically arguing everything we do is to go in the direction of happiness. And the question is, how do, we, how do we find it, or where is it to be found? Some might argue that faith is a really poor place to begin a search for happiness. You may remember that old Billy Joel song, Only the Good Die Young, I'd Rather Laugh with the Sinners Than Cry with the Saints. 
an English poet said of Jesus, you've conquered, O pale Galilean. The world has grown gray from your breath. Look at what you've done, Jesus, to our world. You've, you've made it bad. One pastor writes of his first exposure to Christianity. He was at a, uh, some sort of an event, and a guy shared his testimony, a man who had lived in a gang, and they'd done criminal acts, he'd, all sorts of sexual ex- escapades, and then he talked about how God plucked him out of the middle of their life, and, and this person said, you know, it sounded like Jesus kind of wrecked a rather interesting life. Satan, as the father of lies, tries to enforce the perception that you might find holiness, or you might find forgiveness with Jesus, but it's at great cost. When he calls you to walk towards him, he's calling you to walk away from happiness. And so some people would argue happiness trumps holiness. Former NFL quarterback Joe Theismann had an affair, and this is how he explained it to his soon-to-be ex-wife. He said, God wants Joe Theismann to be happy. <laughs> and you can imagine how that went over. <laughs> All that to say, few people in their quest for happiness start with God. John Calvin said, everybody's seeking after happiness, but scarcely one in a hundred will try God. And many kind of wonder, what would God possibly know about happiness? In fact, I've heard people say, the word happy is not even in the Bible. And, and I've been challenged, uh, I picked up a book at the Vernon Library. I'm always amazed at how many good Christian books are at the Vernon Library. There's a good section. Now, you have to be careful, but there's some good stuff there talking about happiness. And, 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 and I've also been struck many times just how, you know, sometimes the Bible is complicated. Sometimes we, we struggle through a passage. Sometimes you hear Pastor Don say, we don't really know for sure what the intent is. Here's what we think it might be. And sometimes the Bible is so amazingly, perfectly clear. And this morning, a reminder, when we, when we pick up the Word of God, you know, when, when I look at the sign, I go, like, who wrote this? And what was their intent? What was their motivation? And think, I think this was a government thing. There's a lawyer behind this. Ignore. Reminder, we are taking up the book that, that God inspired. Written by man, but by God breathed those words to the authors. So these are the words of life, and, and, and the Bible talks of its power. It, it can do wonderful things in the heart. This God who is the source of everything good. And so I want to just go to a familiar psalm. Maybe if you grew up in a Christian family, you were, this is one of the ones you you were to memorize as a child. I remember those days as a kid going through this. A very familiar psalm, but one that speaks to this quest. And I think it's just a, a great reminder for us. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous." but the way of the wicked will perish. Classified as a wisdom psalm, not unlike the Proverbs, but I, w- I want to just kind of hit that first word, the word blessed or asher, and it's one of those words I think we get very familiar with in the church, but if you were to ask me or ask yourself, well, what, how would you define this word? What does it actually mean? We might struggle, and, and uh, the author of the book I was reading it, it was arguing, you know, back when the Bible was first translated, this blessed word was really a synonym for the word happy, and people understood that and, and would have readily understood this at the time, but that this word blessed has taken on a different kind of hue over the years and over the, the many decades that have passed since then. And that blessed today is probably more often associated in people's minds with the word holy than the word happy. So there might be some confusion. Maybe you're one of those people who gets it. I've always been a little bit slow on the uptake. But here's the argument they would make. The better translation would be happy. And and there's often pushback to that word because, as many people argue, the the word happy is kind of a weak word. One scholar said it has very limited emotional connotation. It's not a great word. That said, other scholars would argue, but it's, it's the right word. It's the accurate word. And, and one professor argues the best running would be truly happy. This one professor would argue that this, the book of Psalms, really one of the major themes through the Psalms is, is instructions on happiness and then also instructions on holiness, that they're not in opposition, but they come together in the Psalms. And this word is sprinkled throughout the Psalms about 26 times. 
And, 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 and here the psalm opens the entire book and asks you the question, do you want to be happy? Do you want to be truly happy? And I, I ask you this morning, how, how are you doing in that regard? Very challenged by that book. Are you, are you happy this morning? Here's something you would be well to take some attention and, and focus on. These, these words of this psalm. Who is the man who is truly happy? What, is, what does he do? What, what is different about him? This is God speaking to us. And he's saying basically, there's, there's two pathways. And here's what the first verse tells us. This is what the truly happy man doesn't do. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He doesn't stand in the waves. He doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. There's some some debate here. Some people would argue there's a sort of a gradual increase and a departure from God, a gradual descent into evil. Others say it's just an emphasis on, on, on this. But... Walking the way the council talks about getting specific advice or, or speaking of a plan, it might be talking about people or principles that detect or determine our actions. And the truly happy man rejects the advice from the ungodly, rejects the philosophy that pushes it or the worldview that drives it. The truly happy man doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't uh, join the way, the general lifestyle of that person who, who has no interest in what God has to say. He doesn't think like the wicked do, nor does he behave or live like the sinner lives. Nor does he sit in the seat of the scoffers. The truly happy man doesn't find his community within the company of those who have rejected God. Kidner summarizes this verse with these words, he says, Cancel way and seat, draw attention to the realms of thinking, behaving, and belonging in which a person's fundamental choice of allegiance is made and carried through. And here's what we need to note here. Whatever shapes your thinking will shape your life. And, and, and I think we understand very clearly as, as we leave from church today, we're not going to have to search out advice or this kind of world that is being talked about here. We're not going to have to search out hard to find people who will argue and, and invite you into their lifestyle, who invite you into the community where they just really have no interest of God. This is a message we are going to get as soon as you open your inbox, as soon as you click on a web page, your pop-up ads will throw things at you. When you turn on the news, you're going to hear it. But the critical thing we need to understand is whatever shapes your thinking will shape your life. If we want to address sin, we don't just start at the behavior that's manifested, but we have to come back and and go to the place where it starts, which is in the mind. And there is an incredible battle for our mind, isn't there? There is a war that is raging. You know, I kind of grew up thinking, man, that, you know, spiritual battle, I don't get it. And the longer you live, you think, boy, it's, it's raging every moment of every day. But what shapes our mind shapes our life. But the truly happy man is marked by a massive difference. Something else shapes his thinking. The Word of God. Here the term Word of God isn't limited to just just the sections that would have been available at this time, but just the general instruction of the Lord. His relationship to the Word is also different. His delight is in the law of the Lord. It's not a relationship of of, of duty. It's not a relationship, you know, we sometimes speak of Bible reading as a discipline, which it is at times where we struggle, but we push through and we we go ahead even though we don't necessarily have that emotional connection at the moment. But I think the longer you spend in the Word, the more it becomes a delight. The longer we, we delve into it and dive into it, the more it becomes precious to us. And the word here, what does he know mean to delight in the law of the Lord? It means to just have a, a strong desire to want or wish strongly to do or feel great favor towards the word. It's used elsewhere in Scripture of, of a delight of a man with a woman. It, you know, when you love somebody, <laughs> you ever seen some of these young people, they start dating and they say, wow, that girl is really amazing. And it's amazing how they find little gaps in the day, isn't it? You squeeze in 10 minutes here. It's amazing the effort that's gone. I've heard of guys driving 12 hours for you know, a morning with a girlfriend. This person treasures 
the Word of God. Psalm 19, if you, you read it, talks about the value and the power of the Word of God as well. When you delight in something, when you treasure something, you find ways to, to be with that person or do that thing. And this perfect person gravitates toward the Word. He meditates on a day and night to mean not every moment of every day, but consistently and constantly and regularly the person goes into the Word. And to meditate literally means to murmur, to kind of say it out loud to themselves or turn it over in their minds. And what they find is that the Word of God penetrates their mind and their heart. That is the God of the Word that is shaping their thinking, that that is their greatest influence, and it changes so many things. You know, we're, Andrew's going to talk about this tonight, the, the effort that was made to give us the Word of God. It, and isn't it precious? You know, I think we forget. You know, we live in an, you know, a day where we're, we're arguing, like, I'm not sure what my favorite translation I have at home is, or... <laughs> I was reading a book talking about a conference in, in China where underground pastors came together and they took a single copy of the Word of God and they ripped it into shreds, gave each one a book. That's all they had. It is a precious book for us. And as we delight in His Word, as we meditate on His Word, as we practice His Word, there's some beautiful assurances in this psalm. First thing is they're, they're fruitful. So they're like a, a tree planted, or uh, some would argue they've they'd been transplanted. They've been taken from a place where water is not in abundance, a place where it would be difficult to, to, to be, and they've been taken by a master gardener, placed near an irrigation canal, and they have all the water they could possibly need. We're, we're in a position now, summer's coming here in the Okanagan, and I've got some fruit trees in my backyard. You're not going to want to eat our fruit. We had some cherries last night. They were kind of terrible. I haven't watered the tree yet. But this tree has been taken by a master gardener and planted in a strategic place where water doesn't lack, and so they bear fruit. And as you think about that, isn't that, isn't that a wonderful assurance? Uh, the person who delights in the word of the Lord, the person who loves it and lives it, they will bear fruit. There's no age limit attached. You don't have to be of a certain age to, for this to be true of you. You don't have to have a certain gift set. If you love the Word of God, if you put the Word of God into practice, you will bear fruit. And, and you think about it, is there any greater desire than to bear fruit that God approves of? Is there any greater satisfaction than to have been used by God to have, bared, excuse me, to have borne fruit? I think it was really neat at the family camp as Pastor Don shared, you know, this is, this is a fruit I've seen in the life of Jason Beck. And then Jason Beck got up and said, this is the fruit of the life I've seen in a kid named Ben. And it was exciting because I think that's what we long to hear is not that we just are approved by other people, but that other people see fruit in our life and it's wonderful. I think sometimes we, we struggle wondering, don't we? As we serve or as we parent, we wonder... Is it is it penetrating? Does it make any difference? I think of Tyler some some nights after junior youth, like he was ice blocking, he probably bruised everywhere. It's like, you know, our kids being changed. You walk away from a Sunday school class, you you see your last person go away from your home group, and you wonder, is God at work? Is is there fruit? And, and, and there's a wonderful promise here as, as we do. I, I, in Galatians, we're encouraged, you know, if you just keep going, it, don't be weary in doing good for in due season you will reap if you do not give it. You've got to keep pushing. You've got to be faithful. You've got to just keep going. And here, in addition to that, not only do you need to just kind of show up faithfully, that's important, and you need to persevere, that's important. But when you show up and you've been touched by the Word of God, there will be fruit. Absolutely. And, and you think about it, I was thinking about that this week, you know, and it's, it's true, isn't it? Talking with my mom a couple weeks ago, came from a, a crazy home, dysfunctional, she left at 14 years of age. She talked about being in a camp led by prayer students, a guy playing guitar, didn't say anything, but she saw in him a peace. And knew in that moment, whatever he had, she didn't have it, and she wanted to get it. And became a Christian. Fruit. I think of a man who had a huge influence on me. I've, I've spoken a number of times, you know, sharing my testimony, a guy named Mel Slack. And, and, and I can't remember a single conversation I've had with him, maybe past him in a foyer once in my years at the church. But he is this man. And it 
powerfully impacted my life. And I thought this morning, if, if, you're, if you're a believer in, in God, your, your greatest desire is to, to give and produce fruit. Here's the assurance. As you pick up the word and you let it penetrate your heart, you live it, you love it, you will absolutely influence those around you. No question. You know, it's, it's not the program and the clever nature of things we do. It's that when God gets a hold of your heart, it echoes out into the lives of those around you. Think of all the places the number of people here in this room walk in a given week. School hallways, workplaces, sports teams. As you interact with this book and as you interact with the God behind it, you will bear fruit. That's a wonderful, wonderful assurance. Also talks about the strength of the person. This person has strength. The leaf, using the metaphor of the tree, that leaf is not going to wither. There is a, a, a health and a vitality in spite of whatever the conditions surround this tree. And we understand this, right? This is not the promise of a life bubble wrapped by God where nothing challenging comes into our life or, or nothing long-term and challenging comes into our life, nothing difficult. This is not a promise of health. This is a promise of God saying, you know what, I will take you through the storm and I will not let it, I will not let it rob you of your strength. I think it's a little bit like the declaration of Paul in 2 Corinthians where he talks about the work and the difficulty and the challenge. He says, we're afflicted in every way but not crushed. We're perplexed but not driven to despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. And then he says these words, so we do not lose heart. He says, we're, <laughs> our leaf hasn't withered. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. As you read the Bible, you know that godly aren't shielded from difficulty, but gloriously God is at work in the lives of those who love Him. And, 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 and again, we've seen this proved true time and time again, haven't we? Just talking with, with Hildy this morning, I don't know where she is, but just talking about the frustration and the difficulty with this brain issue. <laughs> but you hear in her voice a strength. Not that it's never difficult, not that it's ever discouraging, but she knows where to go. She says, you know what? I pick up a song. And I get my head straight and I'm gone. The leaf doesn't wither. You know, I've heard people say, you know, I don't need to go to church. I can pick up a podcast or, you know, back in the day you can get a message on cassette. I can watch it on TV or whatever. But, it's, you know, one of my favorite things to do, and, and I've heard people comment this on, you know, you, you worship at Pastor Andrew or somebody's leading in worship and you, and you look over at the aisle next to you and you say, I know that person's story, but you can see them lost in worship and you think, wow, what an incredible thing. So inspiring to see people whose, whose worship is, is in many ways defiant. In many ways saying, you know what, I don't know what is going on. I don't have answers to the questions in my life. But I'm going to worship and praise God. So inspiring and so encouraging. The person who loves the word, delights in the word, practices the word, they're going to have a strength. They're not going to have a perfect existence, but they will not lose it in pain or problems or fear. The storm will not destroy what God has planted. And he goes on to say, in all that he does, he prospers. And again, we say, wow, you know, <laughs> what is the limitation to this promise? You know, I, as a kid, I always thought, wow, prosper means to me having lakeshore property or this or that. This is not the promise that you'll have incredible comfort or, or that you'll have great wealth, that you'll be the best at whatever you attempt to do, but that God will establish your way. I was reading a book a couple of weeks ago, an interesting story of a guy named Jim Harrell who I've never met, but I kind of told a brief glimpse of his life. He was one of those people who had it all. He was, he was a believer in Christ. He was a Christian. He was a successful businessman. He was strong. He was athletic. He had kind of the whole package, and life was going good until he got a diagnosis of ALS. And in this story he tells, he, he, he had a bit of a debate in his heart because while he didn't love the disease, he could see that God was doing deep work and in his own heart through that. And then he could also see that through his difficulty and suffering, God was opening doors for him to, to minister. So he talks about wanting to be healed, and I don't know if he ever did pray for healing because he had a fear that were God to heal me, in his words, he would say, I fear that within a year I would forget. 
I would forget what all of these taught me. I would forget to lean on him. And so I don't know if he ever prayed for healing, but he made this amazing statement. He said, I've seen more accomplished in the time I've had ALS than in the first 50 years of my life. I think he would say, you look at me physically, it is not the picture of prosperity. But if you look at what God has done, God has blessed me abundantly. I see the hand of God on my life, and it's wonderful. Goes on to say the psalmist, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Not a knowing as in some sort of sense of kind of having the basic information. You know, Chris is amazing. He knows what's going on. Although he made a mistake, he thought I was preaching on the 17th, and I was glad to hear that, because you're not perfect. But generally speaking, if you want to know what's going on, Chris knows better than you do what's going on. Not that kind of awareness, but know in a sense of watching over, protecting, caring for, loving. God is watching over the righteous. Isn't that an amazing thing? When you don't know what's going on in your life, but you know, you know, you know, God has not forgotten me. He is the God who sees. Isn't that a beautiful name of God? The God who sees. And he talks about the, the ungodly. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sit in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. <laughs> you don't have to do a lot of scholarly work to say, you know, that's not something I want. No legacy, no life, it's destruction. There's no hope in judgment. And, and, and in the present, by implication, happiness will be elusive. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> How many times do you hear the story of people who apparently have it all, and yet happiness is so far from them? So here's my question for you this morning, and for myself. Some very, very simple and clear statements about happiness. And what do you, what do, you do with this? I, I, I think a lot of us would say, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm skeptical. I've heard people say of the Word of God recently, one guy say, it's, <laughs> there's not a lick of it that's true. I, I don't know if you've ever picked it up, but he has a very strong conviction. This is just a bunch of hogwash. They read it and immediately question, not unlike how I read a sign on a trail near a broken bridge. But here the psalmist says, truly happy. Truly happy is the man that, that picks up this word of God, delights in it, practices it, sees it as a place of great treasure, meditates on it, and puts it into practice, and that person will be happy. That person will be fruitful. That person will be strong. That person's life will count in the way God measures. It says, let this book shape your mind and it'll change your heart, it'll change your life. So, this morning, I, I know there's a lot of people that come to church and they go like, I, I'm just kind of working through what I'm thinking about faith and everything. Once in a while in our family we do what we call a day of risk. At the back of the church is an information desk. If you ask for a Bible, they'll give you one. If you don't know where to start reading, the person at the information desk will tell you where to start. Or if you're not sure and you're here with somebody and you say, you know, I see some of that stuff that's talked about in the Psalms in their life, ask them where to start reading. But begin to read the Bible this morning and then the next day and then the next day and, and just pray a very simple prayer. Lord, show me yourself. Reveal yourself to me. And, and, and then I would say this. Uh, it's really the reason why I felt led to lead to speak in this message. This is a very familiar psalm. But I've met so many people who have many copies of this book, different translations, in their house, maybe even on their phone. And you have conversation with them. One yesterday, person going through deep waters and say, hey, are you reading your Bible? I had a conversation a couple weeks ago. How's it going? And then you talk to them and they say, well, how did it go? And I said, well, not very good. <laughs> and I, I don't think they're saying, I'm, I'm completely undisciplined. I think they're saying, you know what? I don't really think that's going to lead anywhere. And, and, and it just breaks your heart because if you've ever been to the place like Hildy and you've come to realize the beauty of the word, it's like, how do you, know, have you ever watched those movies where you see somebody walking into a room and you know there's danger on the other side and you're going like, why are you walking into that room? How many times do you see people walking into places and you say, you know what, I know what's on the other side of the door. <laughs> I know what's there and it's not good. 
should come this direction. My encouragement to you this morning would be, pick it up. There is absolutely no risk in doing so. And I guarantee you, isn't it amazing how the promises of the word prove true? The ones you kind of struggle with early on in life, maybe going like, you know what? A few years down the road, yeah, absolutely trustworthy. My encouragement to you this morning, young people, (laughs) older folks, if we pick up this word, if we read it, we love it, we practice it, it's going to make all the difference. And not just to be happy, but think of all those wonderful things to be fruitful, to have strength in the storm, and to have a life where God says, you know what? That is a life that I can pronounce well done, faithful sermon on. Let me just, let me just close in prayer. And I would just say this, you know, if you're struggling uh, in this area, you need some help. I'm sure we could help you find some guys that, or gals that could encourage you in this. But, you know, maybe it's something you don't do alone, but just uh, don't leave it this morning. This is God saying, I'm laying it out there. You can have it. <laughs> but this, this is the only way to do it.